Dr. Paul Kinger is a professor of political science, and he's the executive director of the Center for Vision and Values at Grove City College. You can find him on Twitter at Dr. Dr. Paul Kengor, K-E-N-G-O-R. He is the author of this a very entertaining Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism, which is subtitled The Killingest Idea Ever. Uh, Dr. Paul Kengor, thank you for being here. It's good to see you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Good to be with you. You Especially know, for such an uplifting, up, such an uplifting topic like this. <laughs> well, you know, it's uplifting in a way because the truth is always better than lies. You know, the truth That's is right. always more uplifting than lies. <laughs> and, and we keep hearing a lot about kids talking about socialism. Polls showing that college kids think socialism is a good thing, and all this. Are they? Is this something they're actually being actively taught? Are they being taught that communism and socialism are a good thing? Well, they're not being taught that communism is a bad thing, or at least they're not being taught about it enough. And, and I'll tell you, Andrew, I'll give you one just shocking survey. This was done about a year ago. I think it was October 2016. And the group Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation did the study. And by the way, just the fact that there needs to be a Victims of Communism <laughs> yeah. Memorial Foundation does a lot, right? right? But they found that not a majority, thankfully. Okay, but a disturbing number of Americans, and this isn't just millennials, this is across the board, it was close to a third, actually believe that George W. Bush is responsible for more deaths than Joseph Stalin. Wow, really? That's, it's, it's amazing. Okay. So Absolutely yeah. amazing. And, and I mean, you could, you could only believe that if you've spent the last four years in your kind of local academic insane asylum indoctrination center where you've heard Bush bad, Bush bad, Bush bad, Bush bad, and you never learned about the crimes of communism. And, you know, it's not so much that they're necessarily being taught pro-communism or to believe in communism, but they're, they're just not learning the horrors of it. And I mean, you know, every, everyone ought to know that not only is Stalin responsible for far more deaths than George W. Bush, but he was responsible for more deaths than Hitler was. Hmm. Uh, people should know that, that Mao was responsible for more deaths than Stalin was. And, you know, communist governments killed anywhere from minimum of, of about 100 million people. That's according to the Harvard University Press book, the Black Book of Communism, to as high as 140 million people. And, I mean, you'd have to literally combine all the dead from World War I and World War II and then double them to get anywhere near those numbers. And these weren't, I mean, you talk about George W. Bush killing people. George W. Bush was fighting a war against people who wanted to destroy us. These, these were his own people. These were farmers. I mean, Russian farmers uh, who were being starved to death. And, and the Chinese were wiping out their own guys. Well, that's right. And, I mean, I don't know what number we could even tag Bush with, right? But, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess the most wild leftists could, could blame Bush for, I mean, I guess— thousands of American deaths in an you know, unnecessary war, perhaps, right, if that's what you believe, maybe three or 4,000 deaths, 5,000 deaths, something to that. You can even try to blame him for a number of Iraqi deaths if you want. Uh, but, I mean, that doesn't hold a candle to 60 to 70 million deaths by Joseph Stalin. Yeah, and yeah. The, the, those are the latest numbers by Alexander Yakovlev in a Yale University Press book. He said, Stalin alone killed 60 to 70 million people. It's interesting, you mentioned Joe McCarthy in, in the last segment. I mean, they, they will learn, uh, you know, modern millennials and college students, that Joe McCarthy was a bad guy. And really kind of the only bad Joe that they learn about during the Cold War is Joe McCarthy, right? <laughs> yeah. They don't learn about Joe Stalin. Well, and, well, no. you know, if they, if they learn about the Cold War, they'll learn about the Hollywood Ten and how they were persecuted by, you know, a rabid Joe McCarthy, when in fact they were actually pursued by the, the Democrat-run House Committee on Un-American Activities. And all 10 members of, of the Hollywood 10 were actual card-carrying members of the Communist Party who joined the party under Stalin. Right. Uh, you know, there were a lot of American small-C communists who, who wouldn't join the party because they didn't want to pledge themselves to, quote, ensure the triumph of Soviet power inside the United States, which but, is but, what you pledged to do when you joined CPUSA in the 1930s. Let's let's talk about Che Guevara for a minute. Yeah, I, when you drive, I don't know the last time you've been to San Francisco, but you drive into San Francisco. There's a huge. I don't know if it's still there, but I was there a, a couple of years ago. It's a huge mural of Che, the famous handsome uh, picture of Che with the beret. You see people still. I I hike in the canyons in L.A. You see people still wearing Che. Uh, T-shirts, and I, you often hear uh, right wingers say, "Well, he was kind of a bad guy." How bad was he? 
Well, you probably ought to pull up and take out a ladder and put a little Hitler mustache on it. That probably <laughs> okay. went, went to a lot of friends walking by there in, in San Francisco. Look, uh, Che was a bloodthirsty maniac, killer. And, I mean, I just went through all those different numbers. Well, get this. If Che Guevara had had his way in October 1962, and this applies to Fidel Castro as well, they both actually wanted to launch the nuclear missiles at the United States during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Hmm. Now, the Soviets put the missiles there to check our missiles in Turkey, to try to gain a strategic advantage on the United States, cut the delivery time of missiles, not actually intending to use them. But when the Soviets found out that Che and Fidel actually wanted to use the missiles, knowing that it would unleash nuclear Armageddon, and, and the Soviets said, they said of Che specifically, they said that he wanted to pull the temple down upon his head. Wow. Wanted to pull the temple down upon his head. He saw himself in a religious-like way as this martyr, this would-be martyr to international communism. And, and Fidel later said, what would have happened to Cuba? It would have been completely destroyed. We know that. And so the Soviets saw this in October 1962, and Nikita Khrushchev literally called a late-night, uh, midnight Sunday night meeting at the Kremlin and said, get the missiles out, get them out, get them out, get them out wow. right away. These guys are insane. Wow. And, and if amazing. only he could imagine that American college students would be wearing shade T-shirts, he'd probably <laughs> think, what's wrong with America? <laughs> are they, are they crazy? Well, they, so the uh, he was... And, and he also, he also, Che also ran Fidel's execution pits. He personally executed people. Uh, he was put in charge of, of, of the largest prison site that, that did executions in Cuba, uh, early 1960s. And, and frankly, even Fidel thought that Che was kind of nuts. And in the end, probably, probably allowed him to be taken out to, to, to be rid of him. Just to get rid of somebody he couldn't control. The, the New York yeah. Times has been running this series of articles. I, I, it's, it's one of the most appalling series of articles I've ever seen. It's called Red Century. And it, is. it, it, it comes up with these, these crazy stuff like women had better sex under the Soviets and women had bigger. My favorite was women had bigger dreams uh, under the Red Chinese. I mean, there's a wonderful book called Wild Swans about what women's lives were actually like under the Chinese communists. Oh, it's a terrific book. Uh, but but what... What actually was life like under a communist regime? And I'm, just to remind people, I'm talking to Dr. Paul Kangor, the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism, the killingest idea ever. What, what was life like to, in a, under a communist regime? Well, yeah, it's kind of funny, Andrew. I got an email from somebody who read a piece I wrote for the American Spectator and the New York Times piece about women having better sex under communism. He, he worked along the Berlin Wall in the 1960s. It was his job to, to look through binoculars and watch what was going on on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Hmm. And he said, I could tell you that, that when the sun went down, all the electricity went out, there's probably nothing else to do but have sex. <laughs> oh, so <God>. I, <laughs> so <laughs> you can yeah. read at night, you know, the electricity wasn't working, you had to snuggle up in bed. What else were you going to do, basically? Yeah. Um, they also had the highest abortion rates by far right. in, in East Germany, Soviet Union, and China. In fact, let me add that. For China... Uh, yeah, one of the Times articles that just ran about two or three weeks ago claiming that, that women's lives were, I think, made better was the exact words that, that they use under Chinese communism. Well, here's a statistic that, that you won't find in that article. China has about 20 percent of the world's women. So, I mean, literally one in five women in the world are Chinese. Mm -hmm. They have 56 percent of the world's female suicides. Oh, wow. 56 percent of the world's female suicides. Why? Because life sucks for women yeah. under, under Chinese communism. They, they have a one-child policy, which has recently been expanded to two. They have forced sterilization. They have forced abortion. And, and you know, with the one-child policy, a lot of Chinese girls that weren't identified in the ultrasound and aborted, the parents gave birth to them. And instead, preferring a boy, they would drop the girls off at orphanages. And look around you. I and mean, I've got a bunch of friends who have who have adopted Chinese yeah. children. They're all girls. They're, yeah. yeah, they're all girls. And, you know, life for, for women, for girls under communism in China is lousy. And only a, a I mean, the New York Times is basically running an article there that you would have once seen in Pravda or it's out a, of a party organ in Havana. Well, for or, the New York or, Times, uh, I think... 
uh, a for, uh, for the New York Times, a forced abortion is a win-win because not only do you get to kill the baby, but you get to take people's freedom away. So I think that's a positive thing twice. Well, you get to reduce. Yeah, you get to reduce population growth. You get right. to reduce the the drain on natural resources. And and ironically, though, what you're saying when you really read these articles carefully, and I first saw this in high school uh, civics textbooks that I started reviewing around the year 2000, which are all written by college professors, of course. And the argument that they were making and saying that life was good for women under communism, I'm not making this up, Andrew. They they say basically because women had the right to abortion. Right. And, right. you know, as if, hey, you know, that's all gal needs. Right. You got that, <laughs> baby. You are the freest woman in the world. And, you know, and it also said that it forced women into the workforce. So, you know, women forced into the workforce, 24-7 uh, daycare centers for their burdensome children. Free 24-7 abortion starting in the USSR and the United States. paradise, yeah. Right. So, no. so I, I'm running out of time, but I, I have to ask you, uh, you know, you talk a lot, you talk in this book about the fact that uh, even after the Soviet Union fell, a lot of the people who were couldn't face the failure became teachers in America, and they had the Frankfurt School and things like this. Today, you hear people say, well, I'm not in favor of communism, but I'm in favor of socialism. Right, is there, is right. there something inherent in these ideas that is in itself evil? Because you think like, well, these are people trying to make more equality. And, you know, obviously uh, grotesque equality is not inequality is not a good thing. Uh, there's a there's a kind of a uh, good intentions uh, idea behind it. Is there something inherent in these philosophies that causes this destruction? Well, in Marxist theory, socialism is, is a step on the way to full communism. It's right. a kind of a transitory step on the way to communism. But also, you'll find the communists use the, the word socialism and communism interchangeably. In fact, <laughs> USSR, right? The second S stands for socialism. And here's another thing that's really important. I'm running into a lot of millennials who are saying, oh, I'm a democratic socialist. Well, I got news for you. Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin, I mean, they were in the Social Democratic Party of Russia before it split into the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks in 1903. You mentioned the Frankfurt School, Herbert Marcuse, the, the, the new left guru, the cultural Marxist. He was a social democrat. He was a democratic socialist. So there, there's not a lot of difference in, 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 in these ideas. Wow, wow. Paul Kenger, the uh, author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism, the killingest idea ever. It really is uh, good to get this so that when you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table and your, you know, 17-year-old, uh, you know, nephew starts telling you how great it is, you can just hit him with the edge of this book <laughs> if you uh, don't want to read it and take the arguments. Thank you, uh, Paul. It's been really good talking to you. I hope we do it again. Thanks, Andrew. Hit him with the turkey and then hit him with the book. <laughs> it, it really is an unbelievable uh, state of affairs, the people living in this country. It's that You know, Reagan used to say, Ronald Reagan used to say he wished he could just take the leaders of Russia and fly them over a normal middle-class suburb in America because they would have been so shocked by how well, how well we live here. 